Shalom. <coughs> Shalom, I'm sorry, I've had the Riggler. And welcome to my home, my 900-year-old house in the old city of Jerusalem. Thank you for tuning in. And I hope that this will be an enlightening experience for everyone. I want to start by telling you who I am. I was raised in a conservative Jewish home near Philadelphia. In my home, there was never an assumption that a woman couldn't do anything a man could do. My father's two sisters, and talking here about the 1920s, both of my father's sisters in the 1920s went to college and became professionals. My father wanted me to be, uh, become a lawyer or a doctor. <laughs> I disappointed him on that score. But at, at the age of 16, I mean, I was very much uh, leadership type person. At the age of 16, I became the president of my synagogue youth group, soundly defeating a boy who was a year older than me. I was the first, I was the second time a girl had ever become president of the youth group. And uh, the first time a girl who was just a junior in high school rather than the senior became president of the youth group. So I was very driven um, and never had any qualms about my father used to tell me, I had friends who, um, when they played with boys, you know, games with boys, their parents would tell them, you know, to lose. My father told me, always play to win. And I have in my life. Anyway, for college, I went to Brandeis. And that was in the 60s. The Vietnam War was raging. And I wanted to save the world. So I joined the radical leftist SDS. But then I witnessed something that changed the direction of my, of my life. Our SDS chapter was chaired by a male graduate student and a female undergrad. And they had different leftist ideologies. One tended toward Chinese communism, the other toward Russian communism. Anyway, they fought and screamed at each other in every meeting. In other words, I saw how we professed love for the poor napalm Vietnam, Vietnamese peasants, but we hated the people we actually knew and lived with. And then I read something that crystallized my feelings of discomfort. I had this discomfort of seeing the difference between high ideals and lowly behavior. And I read something that really put it into perspective. Buddhist British philosopher Alan Watts wrote, Peace can only be made by those who are peaceful. So I realized I had to fix myself before I fixed the world. For my junior year in college, I therefore went to India. I found a guru who taught me that my essential identity is that I am a soul. And he also taught me how to meditate, which is a very valuable life tool. I returned to America. I finished my degree at Brandeis, and I joined an ashram on the east coast of Massachusetts with an Indian woman guru. I lived there as a monastic member of the ashram for 15 years. During that time, I was the administrative head of the ashram, the personal secretary to the guru, and I was in charge of the ashram's considerable investments. In the ashram, the whole orientation was that the enemy, the enemy is the ego. The ashram was about working on yourself, your desires, jealousy, anger, pettiness, dishonesty, whatever your, whatever your lower self is about. It was actually a very good preparation for marriage. In 1985, at the age of I was 37. I left the ashram and I came to Jerusalem. The whole story is here in my book, God Winked. Uh, it tells, the first chapter tells about uh, why and how I left the ashram. I came to Jerusalem and uh, <laughs> was shocked to discover the profundity and beauty of Torah. And I became a Torah observant uh, Jew. I had always been a Jew, but I became Torah observant. And I made Aliyah. A month before my 39th birthday, I got married to a 39-year-old musician from, uh, who was from, originally from Chicago and then L.A. 
and he was also about Shuva, like me. And uh, at age 40, I gave birth to my first child, and at age 46, to my second child. I regard Judaism as a spiritual path. For 16 years, I was in a Musarvad with Rav Leib Kellerman, who was, who was a disciple of Rosh Shlomo Walba, the great Musar master of the late 20th century. The Vilna Gaon famously wrote that the purpose of the souls coming down into the physical world is for no other purpose than to do tikkun, ham, tikkun hamidot, fixing one's character traits. So that is where I'm coming from, that we are here in the world, we all have some kind of mission to do, a unique mission, each one of us. I think mine has to do with writing and, and speaking. But in addition to that, and behind that, we are here to work on our midos. The major influence in my life has been Rebison Hayasar Kramer, about whom I wrote the book Holy Woman. She was a, an amazing Sadekis, a survivor of Auschwitz, and um, a, a very strong woman with a very like fiery personality. She went through hell, everyone who was in Auschwitz did. And she married Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Kramer, who was the Lamed Rav Sadi. I believe that Rebbe Sinai Sara was the Lamed Rav Sadi also. And uh, she was like a, your classical Sadekis. She knew what was going to happen in the future. She could read minds, which was a very annoying <laughs> skill she had, annoying to those of us who were in her presence. And, uh, and she gave blessings that were fulfilled. But the thing that most like, impressed me about her more than the miracles she could do, was how she worked on herself throughout her life to become the best person she could be. And that's really, in this book, it's not just a biography of Sadekis. It's a book, the book is about how each one of us can fulfill our own highest spiritual potential, using her as an example. And uh, throughout the book, I have these... Uh, these sections called the fork in the road, where I dis discuss her, her choices, because we all make choices. And the most important choice that we make is the choice to become the best person we can become spiritually. So some 12 years ago, a distinguished Rebison asked me to write a Jewish version of the book, The Surrendered Wife by Laura Doyle. I didn't do it, did not write a book. Instead, I developed a Torah-based system for women to work on themselves spiritually through their marriages. Its basis, the basis of my system, which is called Kesher Wife, Kesher means connection. The basis is that marriage is a triangle comprising you, your husband, and God. And I'll talk more about that later, but that's, that's the basic idea. And so that's where I'm coming from. And now I will answer questions. I will, I will take the questions based on, uh, for, on the order in which they came. Some questions were sent in to us uh, through email. And um, Hannah is here on the line with us. And she will read the questions uh, as, that came in. And then we'll take questions. Please feel free to write your questions in the question box. Obviously, if I've already answered them by the time, by the time I finished answering the questions that came in by email, uh, then I won't address them again. But otherwise, I am happy to address all relevant questions about exactly what Kesha Life is about. So, Hannah, what's the first question? You have openly admitted that your program is based on Laura Doyle's Surrendered Wife, but the Surrendered Wife is based on Christian fundamentalist tenets. How can you reconcile that? I took two foundational ideas from the surrendered wife. The first is that a, the wife by herself can improve her marriage. She does not have to wait for her husband to get on board. And the second idea is that a marriage drastically improves when a wife stops criticizing, correcting, and controlling her husband. So those two basic ideas I got from Laura Doyle. And then I drew on my decades of Torah learning, specifically Musr and Hasidus, to create my own program called Kesha Wife. 
which is, as I always say, a spiritual growth group for married women who want to work on themselves through their marriages. As I mentioned, I was in a Musarvad for 16 years. I used the, the techniques of Musar and the, the whole Kesha wife system is not just uh, the Kesha, you know, the, the surrendered wife transposed into like a Jewish costume. Kesha wife is not based on any, is not based on the surrendered wife. I don't even own that book. And I only read it once. It, the Kesha wife is based on, if it's based on any books, I would say it's based on Rav Shlomo Walba's books, Olam Hayedidut, and uh, his classic book, um, his classic Musa work called uh, Ale Shur. These are the books that are the basis of Kesha wife, not Laura Doyle's book, Surrendered Wife. Oh, and another book that I say is, is basic to the whole, what I teach, I mean, I've been teaching Kesha Wife for almost 10, more than 10 years. If you start, I, used, I started with live uh, workshops all over the world. And then, thank God, uh, Jewish workshops offered to let me sit in my home here in the old city of Jerusalem and just do it by webinar, which I prefer. Because I don't believe that any book can really transform your life. Books inspire you for a certain amount of time. And then, you know, then kind of the inspiration wears off. So having a continuous weekly webinar where women are given constantly new exercises and we have, uh, you know, true to the Musser method of charting, we have charts. This is right, right now we're working on kavod, kavod for oneself, kavod for others, including your husband. Cool. So this is a chart that, that uh, we have. An, I, I do all the exercises that I recommend to the Kesha Wife members. But also, if there's any book that uh, in English that I'm based that I base Kesha Kesha Wife program on, it's this book, Battle Plans, that I wrote with Rabbi Sinsapora Heller many years ago, which has 56 specific tools. Kesha Wife is a tool-based system; it has methods. I call them battle plans to fight the lower self, the Yitzhahara, and. Uh, and this book is, draw, draws on the teachings of the Maharal, the Ramchal, and the Hasidic and Musar masters. So this book, more than <laughs> not at all Surrendered Wife, this is the book that is the basis of Kesha Wife. Um, do you have the next question, please, Hannah? You're not a psychotherapist or a marriage counselor. What gives you the right to give marriage advice? Yes, I'm not a psychotherapist and I'm not a marriage counselor. And I do not give advice based on psychological principles. Everything I teach is based on spiritual principles, which as I've shown you, I've studied for the last 37 years. And I've not only studied these principles, but I use them in my life. I, for 30, for many, maybe when did I join Rob Kellerman's Musravad, maybe 30 years ago, I always had a Musser chart on my refrigerator and I'm always working on myself. Kesha Wife is tool-based. I never recommend a tool for the members of my Kesha Wife Club that I myself don't practice. Psychology, psychology has its place. And I recommend going to a therapist to work out problems, childhood traumas, blocks, anxiety disorders, OCD, et cetera. Um, there's something called the Anxiety Center, David. Dr. David Rosemarin, who is an orthodox uh, psychologist who's on the staff of Harvard Medical School, has uh, branches of the Center for, Center for Anxiety. I recommend people to, to avail themselves. Their husbands need it if they need it. If your husband is willing to go for therapy with you, for marital therapy, then great. But we have many Kesha wives who have gone to marital counseling for years and are still butting their heads against the same problems. So you have two th phenomena, phenomena going on. One is the, where the husband will not go for marital counseling with the wife. And the other is they do go, but 
the same problems can, are not the problems are not resolved. And when these wives, they tell me, I have many Kesha wives who tell me that they went to marital counseling for years and still had the problems. But when they started practicing the Kesha wife tools, their marriages radically improved. Kesha wife is a different derech, a different path than marital counseling and psychology. It's not psychology. It's a Torah method of working for it on oneself. One of our mottos is the only person you can change is yourself. But when you change yourself, you change your marriage. So you know, all wives that join the Kesher Wife Club wanting to change their husbands, whether it's something small or something big. And they come across this truth that the only person you can change is yourself. And this is this is just the reality. People who women will say to me, I've been married 35 years. For 35 years, I've been trying to get my husband to do X. It <laughs> hasn't helped. No, for 35 years, and you're still trying. I mean, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over again. I think you'll have a different result. So in Cash Your Wife, instead of trying to get our husbands to change, we change. But when we change, our marriages change. Okay, next question. You have written that a wife should leave the management to the, of the finances to the husband. This is a mis misogynist viewpoint that supports outdated gender roles. In general, your program does not recognize the new possibilities of the modern woman. Yes, I do believe that in most cases, the husband should have the headache of dealing with finances. This, of course, is a generalization. I listened to one podcast that condemned Kesher Wife. It was... Uh, very, it was very gentle condemnation. It was uh, conducted by a rabbi and a marital therapist. And their criticism was that it deals in generalities. Kesher White deals in generalities. Then they were also talking, of course, about the book um, Surrendered Wife. And that the, both my program and the book Surrendered Wife are deal in generalities. They're not specifically suited to each couple, as marital therapy would be. So, of course, this will always be true for any book or any program that it deals with generalities. When I first started teaching the Kesher Wife Workshop live, I was teaching in a city in America. And after the workshop, a woman came up to me and said, if I let my husband be in charge of the finances, we would lose not thousands of dollars, but millions of dollars. <laughs> so I told her, in that case, you should obviously keep control of the finances. One of the things about Kesha Wife is that it is an interactive uh, webinar and workshop, and the women who belong get to speak to me one on one at, every few months. So I'm, I am able to fine tune it, adjust it to the specific, um, to specific situations, and specific couples. Um, and, and I always tell them that you know there are certain situations in which. You shouldn't be following any of our principles or using any of our tools. When you're pregnant, when you're right after birth, when you're sick, forget, do not use our tools. So I'm very specific about, you know, like when you shouldn't be working on yourself because instead you should be taking more, take more care of yourself. It's interesting to me that when women speak of new possibilities of gender roles for women, they always mean that women should assume the roles traditionally played by men. Now, in the Kesha Wife Club, we do, and I call it a club because the women who are in it, we are not only, they're not just connected to me, they're connected to each other through the questions that they ask, through the being on, the, the webinar, and, uh, and there, there's a great deal of sense of support to each other. Um, we have in the Teshuai Club lawyers and doctors and psychologists and scientists and actuaries and, you know, very hushu uh, professionals. But I believe that the modern world has opened up a much greater opportunity for women than to become a professional like a man. 
And that is the opportunity to pursue their inner spiritual development. A century ago, when women had to wash the laundry by hand, they didn't have time to focus on their spiritual development. A century ago, women's spiritual life consisted of saying to Hillam, you know, here and there when they had any time during the day. But now women can learn and teach Torah. They can take time to meditate. They can do Heshbon Hanefesh, which we teach is a very important tool, daily tool in the Heshbon Life Club. They can do his photodus, talking to Hashem out loud in their own words. I don't consider a woman who works a 40 or 50 hour week and has no time for her inner life to be liberated. <laughs> I don't think that's a liberated woman. A woman who is so overwhelmed and stressed out by working, in some, no matter how prestigious the job, and she has no time for her inner life, that's not liberation. Liberation, freedom is an internal thing. And you have to consciously work on it. And that takes time and headspace. I want to be very clear and honest. Women are more spiritual than men. This is the reality. There are more mitzvot that apply to men because they need more mitzvot to connect to God. Women are by nature more connected to God. Many members of my Kesher Wife Club complain about their husband's low spiritual and religious level, you know. It's, I mean, it's harder for men. You know, they have to get up to make minion every morning. It's, it's, it's harder. They have more things to do. It's harder. But we have a lot of members who, like, are down on their husbands for not being so religiously tuned in or spiritually tuned in. A woman in the modern age, or I guess we should call it now the postmodern age, should avail herself of the opportunity to pursue a spiritual path that will develop her midot, her character traits, which is the whole purpose of the soul coming down into the physical body, as we quoted the Gaon of Vilna before. So the recognition of women's higher spiritual status that, I think, is the direction we should take in the recognition of the opportunities for greater roles for women in this age. When they have, to have the opportunity to develop their greater spirituality. Okay, and what's the next question? Your method of accepting your husband's criticism as from Hashem is a recipe for abuse. As wives, are we supposed to just accept whatever comes our way is from our husbands as God sent? Very important issue. First of all, I begin every introductory workshop. When I gave them live, every single workshop, and now in the webinar, every introductory workshop, I begin each one by announcing the Kesha White program is not for women who are married to men who are abusive or addicted. The problem is that it's hard for wives to identify an emotional abuser. A physical abuse, I've been talking about, obviously, if a man is physically abusive, it's clear. But emotional abuse. Emotional abuse is much harder to identify. Abuse as defined, emotional abuse, it's the only kind of abuse I'm talking about. It's defined by experts as exerting power and control. So a husband may have a short fuse and yell, but that doesn't make him an abuser. On the other hand, there are husbands who never get angry, always soft-spoken, but they are abusers because they control their wives. They control who she sees, how she spends her time, what she does. That's abuse. But again, it's very hard to identify. So I always, if a wife talks to me and she suspects in any way, or I suspect anything she tells me, that her husband might be abusive, I recommend that she read the book called, I'm So Confused, Am I Being Abused? This is a book by uh, 
marital therapist, Lisa Torsky. And she has in this book, she asks questions where the person who's reading the book even like answers the questions and then it becomes clear. Is she in an abusive marriage or is simply a dysfunctional marriage? Again, the book is called, I'm so confused, am I being abused? So if a woman is married to an abusive man, the Kesherite tools will not help her and they'll even hurt her. Kesher wife is not for women who are married to abusive men. I cannot state it often enough or more clearly enough. But most women are not married to abusers. <laughs> most, uh, I mean, when we hear the stories, they're terrible. And it feels like, oh, you know, but the majority of husbands are not abusers. Most women are married simply to men who are flawed. Because all men are flawed, all women are flawed. So the problem is, how can I be happily married to a flawed man? And that's the problem that the Kesher White system successfully addresses. Not by eradicating his flaws, that's an impossible thing. But by teaching women how to change themselves. For example, let's say by focusing on the positive. And most of all, to put Hashem into the picture. It is possible to have a great marriage with a flawed man. We just need the tools for how to do it. And that's why Kesher Wife is all about tools. It's a toolbox. The founding principle of Kesher Wife, as I mentioned before, is that marriage is a triangle. Through you, your husband, and God. The question was, um, you know, it encourages abuse to tell wives that they should just accept their husband's hurtful behavior. You know, it's coming from God. And this, in fact, was the accusation against me in the Atlantic Monthly article that um, I think started all the hubbub on social media and all the condemnations because uh, this article, which was really aimed at the book, The Surrendered Wife and Laura Doyle, but, she, but the author mentioned me in one paragraph. And, uh, and what she said was true. <laughs> she quoted me accurately. But I said that when your husband hurts you, it's coming from Hashem. So what does that mean? I, I'm going to have to go into this. And we're going to have to take the time to go into this a little bit deeply because this is the very basis of Judaism. The first commandment of the Ten Commandments, when God introduced himself to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, what did he say? I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. The rabbi said, This doesn't sound like a commandment at all, it sounds like a statement. The rabbi say it is the commandment of Amun. Amunah means believing, having faith that there is a God, and the definition of God. <laughs> is that he is in control and he is one God, one operative force in the universe. That's what Jewish monotheism means. Not that there aren't many like idols, it's, it's, it's not what we mean. There's one operative force in the universe. And, and the God who took you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage means I am involved in your life for your benefit. That is the God that Jews believe in. A God who is the one operative force in the universe and who acts in our lives, in our personal lives. So if you have an argument with your husband and you say, you know, Hashem has nothing to do with that. Hashem has nothing to do with the argument I just had with my husband. My friends, that's heresy. Because Hashem has something to do with everything. Ain od mil vado is the basis of Judaism. It means there is no other operative force in the universe. When you leave God out of the picture, you leave, you leave everything out of the picture. Now, human beings have free will and they're accountable for their choices. So let's say your husband criticizes you and he makes you feel bad. Now he's wrong to criticize you. It's the sin of honest divorce. There's a sin in the Torah that of called hurting other people with words, honest devouring. 
and your husband's wrong to hurt you with words, and he will be judged by Hashem, as we will also be judged for our hurtful speech that we inflict on our husband or anybody else. So that's between you and that's between your husband and, and Hashem. But that you were hurt was determined by Hashem on Rosh Hashanah. In Rosh Hashanah, we believe Hashem determines how much challenge, suffering, travail, every one of us needs that year for our tikkun, our rectification. And as I said before, I can't say it often enough, the very purpose for our souls coming down into the physical world is to do our, is to do our tikkun, to do our rectification. And most, most of us human beings, we grow most through the challenges and the afflictions and the sufferings and the things that aren't hunky-dory in our lives. Now, so that's the term of Rosh Hashanah and Seal of Yom Kippur. How much suffering I need this year to do my tikka. How that suffering comes to me is not determined. My husband has free choice. So if he chooses to criticize me, then it comes to my husband, but he could choose not to criticize me. But I'm still gonna have the same amount of travail or suffering or discomfort. I could be pickpocketed. I could be involved, God forbid, in a car accident. I could get fired from my job. The Midrash says Hashem has many bears and lions. So, there's a, so this is a paradox that we have to understand. Your husband is accountable for his choices. And at the same time, everything that comes your way is from Hashem. This is a deep and far-reaching concept, and I really can't go into it more in this Q&A. But we do learn in Kesha White to put Hashem into the picture. Because any picture without Hashem in it is a phony picture. It doesn't portray reality because Hashem is reality. Now, I'm not advocating passivity. When your husband does something that hurts you, you don't take it lying down, like, you know, just, oh, I just have to suffer. No, that's never our way. You jump up and you grab one of our Kesher wife tools to turn the obstacle into a stepping stone to move forward in your own growth to spiritual greatness. For example, we have a great tool for dealing with a critical husband. It's called like water off a duck's back. Many women have very critical husbands. We have a tool, it takes an hour for me to explain the tool. You get it if you join the Kesha Wife Club, which I hope that you'll give it a try. And, uh, and this tool, like. Water up a duck's back works for dealing with a critical husband. So you don't just become passive when something happens in your marriage. You become active. How do you become active? You don't counterattack. You take one of our Kesha Life tools and you use it to forge your own path forward to your own spiritual greatness. Okay, I hope that's clear. Can we have the next question? Your methods stifle women's voices. It's unhealthy for either of the partners, be it the husband or the wife, to be unable to say what's on their mind. You can't have an intimate, close relationship if each partner can't share their feelings. So this is one of the most destructive ideas in modern society, that you should say whatever you think. In modern society, the right to express one's feelings is a sacrosanct, sacrosanct value. Well, what if your feelings are negative? What if the husband feels like he truly feels that the wife spends too much time on her phone? Shouldn't you tell her so? But what if the wife feels, she truly feels that the husband wastes too much time watching sports, he could be spending that time with her or the kids. Should she tell him so? So interesting to me that Harville Hendricks, who is America's marriage guru, he innovated Imago Relationship therapy, uh, therapy. He appeared on the Oprah, Oprah Winfrey Show 17 times. And his best-selling book, 
Getting the Love You Want, sold more than 4 million copies. So he's in his introduction to the 20th anniversary edition of that book, Getting the Love You Want, Hendrix made a startling admission. In his original edition of the book, and in the thousands of workshops that he gave worldwide through those 20 years, he advocated, he had advocated that if you feel anger, you should express it to your partner in an exercise he called the full container. At the same time, he taught a method for the partner to listen to the expression of anger with compassion. So that here's one partner who's expressing their anger, getting it off their chest, being honest, and the other, and he gives the other one some kind of a tool in order to listen with compassion. After 20 years, Harville Hendricks realized that expressing strong negative feelings was actually disastrous. He says it in, in the introduction to this 20th anniversary edition of his book. He says, this is what he says. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it to you. He says, at the time, at the time we believed that this catharsis would reduce the amount of tension in their day-to-day -day interactions. The opposite proved to be true. We discovered that the more couples practiced the exercise, the angrier they became with each other in their daily lives. This is what he discovered 20 years after the fact. He says, goes on to say, it's all in his book, the 20th anniversary edition of the book. As I explain at length in this new chapter he wrote, we now believe that eliminating negativity is the most powerful way to transform a love relationship. A lot of damage was done in those 20 years of telling people to express their negative feelings. So he's admitting that eliminating negativity is better than expressing it. In Kesha Wife, we work on eliminating negative feelings rather than expressing them. Okay, next question. The idea of a wife surrendering to her husband or submitting to her husband is out of the dark ages. How can you suggest such a thing? In modern parlance, you know, the, the word surrender is equivalent to losing. Two countries fight a war. One wins, the other one loses. The one who loses surrenders. Famously, General Robert E. Lee at the end of civil, the Civil War, he surrendered. Like there's many pictures of General Robert E. Lee's surrender at the Appomattox uh, Courthouse. General Lee wanted to win. He fought hard to win, but in the end he lost, so he surrendered. That's a zero-sum game. One side wins, the other side loses, and the total gain for the world or the community or the family is zero. The conflicts in marriage, and there will always be conflicts in marriage. Conflicts in marriage follow a different paradigm. They're not, or they shouldn't be, two enemies fighting. Or one is, is one's victory is the other one's loss. If that's the kind of marriage you have, then even when you win, you lose. You might get your way, but you've lost the harmony and connection that you could have had in your marriage. Kesha wife does not teach women to be weak. It teaches them to be strong with true self-esteem. What is true self-esteem? It is based on the recognition that they are a holy soul created by God, connected to God and beloved by God. That is a person's true identity, every person. And we spend, we have a true self-esteem workshop, two or three hours to inculcate this, because when you have true self-esteem, then you can weather the ups and downs of marriage much better. A person who has that inner strength doesn't have to seek outer victories. We understand that the true battle, as I wrote in, in my book, Battle Plans, the true battle is not between you and your husband. It's between your higher self and your lower self. In Kesher White, we laud spiritual victories, victories over our own lower self, that mean, petty, jealous, depressed, anxious part of ourselves. 
that's always in conflict with our higher self. Every week we have a Kesha wife of the week who shares her success story, where she scared, where she scored a spiritual victory. That's what we applaud. Those are the victories that are important. I think you've heard a great deal from me so far. I'd like to hear an answer to this question about surrendering and submitting from a member of the Kesha Wife Club. We have one here on the line. She happens to be a lawyer and she's taken time out of her busy day at work to be with us today. And I'd like her to, uh, to tell us about her own experience in Kesha Wife. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. And we can okay. hear you. Okay. I have been a Kesha Wife for almost 10 years. My husband and I have raised four amazing children, uh, but each of them had very significant health problems as a child and required a lot of extra time and energy. I work in a high power position in corporate America, and at any given time in the last 20 plus years of marriage, I've also been on the board of at least two nonprofits and do a lot of uh, charity work in the community. As an also works in a busy corporate job, and although I have generally made more money and I'm in a higher level position, I'm always busy, stressed, and tired. My husband grew up in a traditional home where his mother stayed home can I and took care of the house. Can, can I ask you, please, be just a little slower so that we don't miss any of the sure. valuable things you're sharing with us? We heard so far, um, my, uh, I've been, always been busy and stressed and tired, but can you go on okay. that to a little more sure. slowly? Sure. My husband grew up in a traditional home where his mother stayed home and took care of the house. I do all of the cooking, organizing, and doctor's appointments, but he does the laundry and he helps around the house. And sometimes I have to lean on him at the last minute to cover things I usually cover. Also, I'm a snap decision maker. And he is a very methodical decision maker. And can take a very long time to make important decisions. This has led to a lot of clashes, even though in retrospect, I wasn't always right with the decisions I would have made. Over the years, I could tell he was getting increasingly frustrated with me and our marriage. He started to disengage, became less thoughtful, more sharp and critical, less interested in spending time together. I joined the Kesher Wife Club almost a decade ago. During that time, I have changed myself. I have become more considerate of my husband, relinquished some of the control over everything my type A personality wants, tried to cut back a bit on extracurriculars, and devote more time to my husband and family. I have put Hashem in the picture. I reminded myself that if Hashem wants us to have a new car, we will get one when we're supposed to, even if I feel that my husband is dragging his feet, missing the sale, and taking too long. I have reminded myself over and over of all the tools you have provided us and learned to respect my husband and to show that respect. Using the tools of the Kesher Wife Club has changed me as a person and changed my marriage. I am a happier, calmer, more fulfilled person, and my husband has become more loving, thoughtful, and eager to make me happy. I have always wanted a larger house, always looking on the market. Our finances were such that we could afford a larger house, but my husband wouldn't even look. Suddenly, after years of applying the Kesher Wife tools, my husband decided to buy us a larger house, made tons of big decisions quickly, and became the spender, a total reversal of our roles. What did I want in the house? How could he make me happy? What else could he do? We have made a lot of big decisions together in the last few years, and we have very different tastes in a lot of things. But instead of becoming arguments and points of contention, the decisions have brought us closer. After over 20 years of marriage, he started to buy me flowers every shot. He looks at me with love, asks me out on walks, 
asks to play games together, goes on vacations with just the two of us. It's like he fell in love all over again. Your tools haven't just saved my marriage. They have brought it to a whole new level. My kids, as they grow up, ask me for marriage advice and have told me how impressed they are with my bitachon, my faith in Hashem. Let me tell you that 10 years ago, I was so far over the hishtagra line, the effort line, that the bitachon, the faith part, was almost lost. I was so disturbed by the recent portrayal of the Kesher Wife Club in an article in the Atlantic magazine. Submission is an English word fraught with meaning and in no way represents the Torah approach that you teach. Vatranut, the idea of submitting to God's will, simply cannot be translated. Never have you taught that my needs, my will, and my respect are not important. In fact, you require each Kesher wife to start your class with a series on self-esteem because none of your tools can work if you do not respect yourself. You have always taught that in order to t- love others, you have to love yourself first. In order to take care of others, you have to take care of yourself first. And in order to respect others, you have to respect yourself first. You have taught your Kesher wives to be considerate of their husbands, to remember that no human is perfect, and that marriage is a three-way triangle that includes God. It is not a store where you tally up who has given what and who has taken what. You have told us that when our husband yells at us, we shouldn't just ignore it. Or if we, if we can, we should ignore it. And if not, we should calmly tell him that he cannot speak to me this way. And I would be happy to discuss the subject when he can speak respectfully and leave the room. You have taught us how to choose our goals, pick what is most important, and negotiate. You have taught us how to balance demands from kids and spouses and parents and siblings and friends. You have also told us time and again that your tools are not for wives in abusive marriage marriages. I'm extremely frustrated at the many women who commented on your class without ever attending it or spoken to anyone who did. I hope that your tools and life skills are not lost to the next generation of wielding of women trying to build a Bayit Ma'amon with love and support from a Kesher wife. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. I think more valuable hearing from you than hearing from me. And um, in your experience, I hope, I mean, my, my genuine hope is that um, people listening to this will consider as part of their own spiritual development, their own spiritual path, consider joining the Kesha Wife Club, okay? Let's go on to, we have time for more questions. Let's see, uh, there's an, another question that came in today, I think, uh, by email. What is that, Hannah? Some years ago, you quoted to me a Robinson who said to you about a woman's relationship with her husband. He is king, he is king, he is king. Do you believe that still? If so, how do you interpret it? If not, what caused you to change your mind? So it's the Rambam, Maimonides, who said that a wife should treat her husband as a king. He preceded it, and this is important. People get quoted out of context. I was quoted out of context in the Atlantic uh, Monthly, but uh, Rambam saying that a, a woman should treat her husband as king is quoted out of context. The Rambam starts by quoting the Talmud. In the Talmud, in, in, in Yabama 62b, it says, a man should love his wife as himself and respect her more than himself. Rambam in Hilchus Isha 1519, he he quotes that Gemara, but he reverses the order. He puts respect before love. He says that a man should respect his wife more than himself and love her as himself. And then in the next, very next line, he says, now addressing himself to the wife, he, said, he says, she should honor her husband more than enough. Your term be die means more than enough. And he should be in her eyes like a prince or a king. She should go with the desires of his heart and distance herself from all that he hates. So this is the Rambam. Both husband and wife are enjoined to respect each other greatly. 
Now, sometimes you'll hear like that. If you treat your husband like a king, he'll treat you like a queen. That's the idea that you're not, you're not the servant. You're the queen. <laughs> you're sitting on the throne next to your husband. How does the queen treat the king? She treats him with respect. How does the king treat the queen? He treats her with respect. So you're asking me, do I believe that? <laughs> do, do I believe that you should treat your husband like a king? Well, yes. I've seen in the Cash Wife Club that when a wife stops criticizing, correcting, and controlling her husband, he begins treating her respectfully as well. Criticizing, correcting, and controlling are disrespectful behaviors. So when you start treating your husband respectfully by stop criticizing, correcting, and controlling him, he will also eventually start treating you respectfully. This is our experience in the Cash Wife Club. But I think the issue here is the definition of king. I think the reason why it, it riles some women is, you know, king. Like if we think of a king as someone who issues edicts and you better obey or off with your head, then uh, obviously that's not how we should regard our husbands. But there's also what's called a constitutional monarch. I don't know if you saw the Netflix series or The Crown about Queen Elizabeth. I watched it. So Queen Elizabeth makes important decisions. She's the queen. And she makes important decisions for... United Kingdom. She also consults the Prime Minister, the head of the Church of England, other important advisors, and people respect her greatly. It doesn't mean that no one can disagree with her. That's a constitutional monarch. So the idea should be to respect your husband, and then he will respect you. Unless, of course, he's an abuser, in which case the Kesha Wife Club is not for you. Okay. Um, Hannah, what other questions have come in? Yeah, we've received a few more. You identify as Haredi, but many, many Haredi women are wives of men in Kolel, and these women work 40 hours a week besides raising a family with only minimal support from their husbands. How can they do what you suggest? I am totally against it. The Hazat Ish, who died in 1953, he was the Gadol Hador here in the land of Israel, he said, in, it, I don't know if he said it in 53, 1952, 1951, but sometime around 1950, he said this whole idea of men sitting in Kolel for their whole lives and the woman going out of the home to support them, uh, you know, like this was not, this is not the way things ever were in the Jewish world. And someone came to the Hazanish and said, and asked, you know, his daughter wanted to go to work and let her so that her husband could stay in Kolel. And the husband, Ish, said that after the total destruction of the Torah world and the Holocaust, we need to rebuild the Torah world this way. And the father of the girl asked, how, how long? And the husband, Ish, answered, three generations. Those three generations are up. The Torah world is rebuilt. I am very against women leaving their six-week-old children. And in Israel, we get three months for maternity leave. In America, you get only six weeks. Women leaving their six-week-old babies in childcare and going off to work and working 40 hours and coming home exhausted and having to cook and take care of the children in the house. I'm absolutely exhausted. This is abuse of women. And I recommend to Kesha Wise, whenever they'll listen to me, most don't, to quit their jobs. And their husband should go out and work and support the family, which is what the ketubah obligates a husband to do. A ketubah obligates a husband to support his wife. Now, women are told, you know, it's a very noble thing to, to just be mavatar on the ketubah and support your husband in learning. And I think that's fine until the first baby comes. And after that, I don't think that wives should be doing this kind of thing. And every wife who has listened to me and has given up her job, is happier, more relaxed, a better wife, a better mother. And, um, and that's my position. It's not a popular position, but I have seen too much stress, exactly as you said, I've seen too much stress. Women are not supposed to be under that kind of stress. I myself, as a stay-at-home mother, uh, until, my, until my youngest, uh, my son, who I had 46 years old, my miracle son, when he, when he was like seven or eight years old, I started writing for H.com. I started getting more involved in, in, in writing. But when children are young, 
the mother should be. I, I feel the mother should be at home with the children. Now, there are women who want to go out and work. They want to have careers. The, the Kesha wife we just talked about, she, she's a lawyer in corporate America. Okay, she earns more than her husband. And she does the things. She's a very, very competent person. And she's able to do that and do the cash wise. So if a woman feels motivated to do that, and that's her own inner urging, there are women who are born to be, you know, doctors or social workers or psychologists or whatever it is. And, and you know, if they can handle that, that's great if they want to do it. But I really don't think it's good to do it when you, when you have babies, in my opinion. Thank you. The next question is kind of on that. Um, do you consider advice on how to divide uh, roles between husband and wife at home? And do you give advice on this in your workshops? No, I don't. So how to divide the, um, the roles. Obviously, as the Kesha wife we just heard from, you know, she goes out to work. She gets paid more than her husband. She has a higher level position in corporate America. And, um, and her husband does the laundry but she does all the cooking. So the, the husband and wife have to figure that out. I know that um, many wives, especially your wife complain, I hear a lot of complaints that, you know, my husband doesn't help with the children. I had one wife who was saying, you know, my husband comes home from work and he won't help me bathe and put the two young children to bed. They had maybe three children. I asked her, well, what does your husband do? He's a brain surgeon. So I felt like, wait a second, your husband's a brain surgeon, which is such a stressful job. I mean, you know, if we make a mistake, it's something we do, but brain surgeon makes a mistake if you kill somebody. So he's under a terrific pressure. And when he comes home, I think he shouldn't be helping to bathe and put the children to bed because he really needs to relax. So it all depends on each individual, uh, each individual marriage, how they divide things. Thank you. While her concepts are what you call the three sins are definitely helpful to transform a home from a high conflict to a very low conflict zone. I don't see how they're helpful in actually creating or rekindling connection and intimacy. So if the wife is happier giving more time to her self-care, but that's where it ends. And maybe your husband isn't interested in sex, or maybe they simply don't have much in common, or they're empty nesters who spent years in raising kids and kids left, leaving them to own their own devices. So one of our cashier wife tools is date night. The idea is to do have date night once a week. And there are rules of date night. Rules of date night is no talking about problems, finances, business, or children. Date night is a time to connect emotionally. We send out date night questions that are to build emotional intimacy because you are right. It's after years of marriage, especially, you know, well, Totally, you know, dedicate to the children, then the children get, grow up and leave. And then what do you have in common? It's a very big problem. There are very, a big scourge of divorces, people who've been married over 30 years. So, um, so, yes, we talk about this a lot. Date night, date night questions, how to build intimacy. Intimacy, meaning what happens in the bedroom is the Kaddish Kadoshim, the Holy of Holies of a Jewish marriage. It's extremely important. We talk about it a lot <laughs> because, and, and Jewish Workshop offers, Jewish Workshops offers um, webinars in intimacy given by ex experts of sex therapists. It's extremely important. There are some cases where, especially after a certain age, we're talking late 60s, 70s, we have Kesha wives who've been married for 40, we have Kesha wives who've been married couple of them have been married over 50 years. So we have some who are older and their husbands are older. And there's at some point, we have, you know, uh, sex becomes a problem. We talk about good enough sex, which is what can happen later in life. When, so that there can still be intimacy and this feeling of closeness. We do spend a lot of time on it. It's, it's, it's definitely part of our toolbox is to build emotional intimacy and um, going away, you know, by yourself, with you and your husband. Uh, these things are all part, like the Kesha wife who spoke, she said now she and her husband, they've been married, I think, 23 years. Now they're going away, just the two of them, the children are old enough. 
um, very, very important to build that kind of emotional intimacy. You're right. It's not just, I don't like the term shalom bias. Kesha Wife is not a shalom bias webinar. Shalom bias means peace in the home. We're not trying to just get rid of the friction and the conflict in the home. We want to build actual connection. That's why Kesha means connection. Is there another question? Yes. Women don't want to be criticized, corrected, or controlled either. Can you clarify why you're not speaking to husbands? A good marriage depends on mutual respect. Why does this not exist for men? Well, why I don't speak to husbands? Because they're not going to listen to me. <laughs> you know, I speak to people who will listen to me. So, um, yes, it would be great if husbands would do it. The fact is, I just finished ghostwriting a book for men where I use the same tools adjusted for men. My name will not appear on this book, and I hope the book will be out within the next few months. But do not buy it for your husband because he won't read it. If you buy it for him, he won't read it. But yes, husbands should be doing it too. But I can't, just like we say, you know, the only person you can change is yourself. So the fact that husbands should be doing it, yes, absolutely, they should. But husbands aren't going to listen to me. So I don't talk to people who don't listen to me. I hope, I hope that, that you wise will listen to me. And the point of Kesha Wife, which is the, one of the two things I got from Surrendered Wife, is that the wife by herself, without her husband being on board, can change and improve her marriage. She can. I've seen it in hundreds of cases. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, this is the last question, and we did touch a little bit on this, but just um, going through the Tanakh, and we hear stories of our foremothers, um, it is so clear that these women just did not surrender. So I just don't understand where you're getting this I, Jewish idea of womanhood, because when I look at our mothers in the Tanakh, that's not what I see. Well, as Reverend Heller says, you know, it's very interesting, like, the, the who is the best couple in all of Tanakh is Avraham Avinu and Sarah Imenu. And, and we know they were very different. He represented Chesed and she was Gavua. And, the, and the, they were married from the time they were, she was very young. She was 10 years, Sarah Imenu was 10 years younger than Avraham Avinu. And they were married from the time they were very young. And um, we have in, in Torah, we have stories where they conflicted. Stories about, you know, when she said to send Ishmael away, uh, they conflicted. Are there any other stories where they, where they conflicted? Let me think. Um, I don't know. We know the stories that he told her, you know, you're very beautiful, be you know, say you're my sister, and she listened to him. Um, Rebson Howard says, in all the years they were married, the only times, you know, we have like two or three stories where there may have been some conflict. I can, I'm, off the top of my head, I'm only thinking of one, but let's say there were two or three of all the years they were married, which means that all the rest of the time there was harmony. And, you know, where is Sarah? She's in the tent. She was a very internal person, internalized person. So the idea that, you know, in Shanach, we see women standing up to their husbands. Well, we only see those, you know, those cases you know, in the very in the cases where Tanakh is talking about them because they were the exception to the rule. They were not the rule. There was, I did see another question. I, I glanced at the um, question box. Let me put it up here. And I did see one more question. I think uh, um, we should end with this question. When you don't criticize and control, how do you prevent the feeling of bottling things up or constantly biting one's tongue? So, Definitely, you should not bottle things up. It's very destructive for your physical as well as your mental health. So all of our tools that have to do with like, working on your feelings start with being honest about how you feel. How do you feel? I feel angry. I feel resentful. I feel whatever you feel. You have to be honest. That's step number one. We have what's called the four-step method for turning complaints into gratitude to Hashem. First step is how do you feel? Be honest about it. But then what? Once you recognize, I feel resentful. You didn't treat me right. I feel resentful. What do you do? 
we talked about Harvey Hen Harville Hendricks realizing after 20 years of making a big mistake that it doesn't help to express your negative feelings. That damages your marriage, it damages your relationship. So what do you do with those negative feelings? Well, that's what our tools work through. Our tool, the Torah has many mitzvot of, for example, um, don't carry a grudge is a mitzvah of the Torah. It assumes that somebody has wronged you and you are feeling like you're carrying, you feel you have a grudge. It's, a, it's you know, don't hurt or hate your brother in your heart. It assumes you have that negative feeling. And the Torah wants you to work on it. Torah means Hashem wants you to work on it. Okay, now I have this grudge. How do I work on it? What do I do? I have hatred in my heart. What do I do about it? First step is to acknowledge it, but then you start working on it. And that's why Cash Your Wife is a tool-based system that gives you many tools for working on those feelings. But definitely we don't keep them bottled up. Okay, that's all for the questions, Hannah. Yep, that's it for the questions. Okay, I hope that um, all of you have, you know, uh, gotten some better sense of what Cash Your Wife is all about. And I would love to see you in the Cash Your Wife Club. Have a great day.